Welcome to Deeper. This is an episode on all things sex brought to you by Adam and Eve. I'm Dr. Jenny Schuyler. I am Adam and Eve's resident sexologist. I'm a certified sex therapist and licensed marriage and family therapist, and I run the Intimacy Institute. So welcome to the show. Today's topic is female sexuality, mapping out our desire and arousal. So before we get started, let's do some just definitions so that we're all on the same page. Let's really differentiate between arousal and desire. Arousal is how our body gets turned on, right? We feel that in our, in our cells, we feel that in our skin, we just feel that in our senses, our five senses, right? We might feel a tingling in our mouth, we might feel electricity in our neck or ear, we might feel tingling in our nipples, we might feel heat rushing through our body, we might feel some pulsing in our genitals or in our pelvic floor. These are all signs of arousal coming online. So that is our body getting turned on. Desire is what turns on this thing, our biggest, uh, our biggest sex organ, which is our brain. How do we get our brain turned on? So we, what we really wanna explore with this one is how do we clear out the things that don't turn us on and really accentuate the things that do turn us on cognitively. Now, they're very intricately mapped, right? These two things are aligned. We are one whole person. Um, usually what gets our arousal going gets our desire going and vice versa. And sometimes it's hard to figure out which one is going before the other. And sometimes it's really clear. So when we talk about female sexuality, for instance, the metaphor I like to make is the gym. All right, here we are, 5 a.m., cold, snowy, where I am, lots of snow. Don't wanna to go to the gym. By the way, they're not open because it's COVID, but let's pretend they're open. And it's like, uh, I'll go to the gym because I know it's good for me. Because I know once I'm there and I'm inside and I'm on a machine and I'm moving my body, I kind of wake up and I go, oh, I'm booted up. I'm really glad I'm here. So sometimes our desire follows our arousal. We have to trust that our body gets warmed up and gets moving and then our desire kicks in and goes, oh, I'm so glad. And that is really important here because sometimes we don't come to the table with this organic enthusiasm, right? We don't come with spontaneous desire. So one of the women in my field is Rosemary Bassoon and she talks about this concept between spontaneous desire and responsive desire. Spontaneous desire is, oh, I'm spontaneously and organically turned on. And that can happen in new relationships and that can happen on occasion, <laughs> but usually we have responsive desire. We are responding to a stimuli. That stimuli can be our own arousal in our body. It could be uh, if we're ovulating, sometimes we can feel our hormones percolate up and then we're responding to our own hormonal response. We could be responding to something visual we saw, something auditory we heard, a taste, a smell, a kind of touch, our five senses. So we usually are responding to a stimuli, responding to a sexy invitation. So these are all different ways to really turn on our brain, but it's not usually oh, I'm organically excited, I'm gonna have the pom-poms out and here we go, I'm excited to have sex. It's usually I respond to something. So you really wanna be thoughtful, intentional and creative with that stimuli. What is the stimuli that turns this on? And sometimes it's yourself, right? Sometimes it's your own arousal in your body. So now that we have those two definitions, right? Arousal is the body getting turned on, the brain is a desire getting turned on, desire is getting the brain turned on. So as we map out female sexuality, I'm gonna talk about general stereotypes that are typically uh, around for a reason um, and things that kind of debunk that myth. So one of the myths around female sexuality is that um, women have low desire. This is problematic for a few reasons. One is our desire is like our fingerprint, right? It's just a fingerprint. There's nothing wrong with it. We don't judge the fingerprint. It's just a fingerprint. So I am not a fan of qualifying our desire as high or low. I am a fan of describing it in terms of a um, 
descriptive energy, what's happening, what are some blocks, how do we optimize it, but I don't want to pathologize it. We don't get anywhere if we pathologize our desires too high or too low or not enough, right? All we do is feed a narrative that we are not enough and that's not a narrative we want to feed. So I always say that your desire is your desire. Nothing wrong with it. And the truth is there's nothing wrong with it, right? If you didn't have anyone to compare it to, it wouldn't be low desire or high desire. You might have higher desire than your partner or you might have lower desire than your partner. And you wouldn't know if it's high or low because you wouldn't have anyone to compare it to if no one was there. It's in comparison to someone else. So the problem usually comes for couples, and this is what I see um, in abundance in my office, which is when the two desire levels are in conflict, and we call this desire discrepancy. So what we're gonna talk about for in terms of mapping out female sexuality is how to take personal responsibility for your own desire and arousal so you can optimize it. Not because it's a problem, not because it's low, maybe it's higher than your partner's, and you still wanna optimize it so it's in its full efficacy, in its full vitality, and that's just a good thing you wanna do in general. So I wanna be really clear that this is not because it's a problem or because it's too low. Okay. I'll also say this, some women, it's a spectrum, right? If you go to coffee or a hike with your friends and you realize, oh, you know, like these three friends seem to self-pleasure more than I do and have more fantasies than I do or more orgasmic or multiply orgasmic and I just don't, that's not me, it's still not a problem, right? Our level of arousal and desire and our sexuality is on a spectrum, right? It's sort of like sexual orientation. You can be very exclusively um, towards one gender um, or very fluidly kind of loving more, more than one gender. So the idea is that everyone can exist on a continuum and so can your desire. All right, so back to optimizing, right? We're mapping this out so we can optimize. That's the, that's the goal here. So as we think about responsive desire. We really wanna think about that stimuli, right? I come back to the stimuli. How do I stimulate desire to kind of get those gears going? And I like to think about initiation, right? What is my invitation? What is my initiation? What do I need to get turned on? So this is a really important question you have to ask yourself if you're a female, because we're doing female sexuality today, but. If you're not female and you wanna ask yourself this question, go ahead, why not? We're all here and we're all human. The question is, what is my absolute fantasy and how I want to be invited? What language do I wanna be invited with? What nonverbal language do I wanna be invited with? What kind, of in, what kind of ambiance do I want to have be presented to me as an invitation, right? Wanna have sex? not so sexy, right? That's not gonna really turn you on. That's not a stimuli that might do it for you. Or maybe it is, maybe it's really practical and you're like, yeah, that would work. I just wanna be like forward here. So great, that's a great invitation. So different people want different things and you have to be thoughtful around what do I want? So ask yourself, in my magical fantasy here, this is how I would love to be invited. Then when you have that downloaded, you get to articulate that. And maybe a partner is able to execute it all perfectly and maybe some components of it, but at least it's being spoken to so it can have an opportunity to be executed. So things to think about in terms of this foreplay and this initiation fantasy. Logistically, right? What time of day? We just did a savvy sex episode. Actually, it's not out yet, but we did a savvy sex episode on not having sex at night because we're tired and we're fatigued and we're not nocturnal mammals. We're diurnal mammals. We're up with the day. So let's take advantage of having sex with the day. That's my bias. I don't like to be invited in the nighttime because I'm tired. I've got two kids. I've got a full job. I'm tired, right? So daytime, better. Affectionate, right? Do you like affection? Is your love language touched? Do you want more of that affectionate, sweet kind of invitation? Or do you want a more logistical, practical, hey, you know what? I'd love to have sex with you. Or do you want a more physical, nonverbal invitation? Do you want more of that sensual contact with the hips, with the neck, with the ear? Something that differentiates the invitation from affection or flirting. So some things to think about with this. Another thing to consider is relaxation. 
We live in a stressful time right now. There's a lot of different stressors happening on our planet, in our country, in our small little micro worlds. And it's hard to get aroused when we're super stressed. Is sex a stress reliever? Yes. And for female sexuality, if we don't have a lot of testosterone to fuel our arousal, right? We don't have the pilot light on the gas stove to just go boop, it's on. We have to build that fire and we might have to go to the woods and get the wood and chop it and make the kindling and then build the fire and then light the fire. And by the way, all of that's a team sport. <laughs> so it's a little more complicated than the gas fireplace and that's okay but we wanna know some of the key ingredients in terms of making that fire. And I'm a big fan of relaxation because relaxation is about the parasympathetic nervous system and relaxing. And when that happens, pleasure is possible. Pleasure lives in the parasympathetic nervous system. Pleasure grows from relaxation. So if you are stressed and you're like, okay, gotta have sex, check off the box, that's not gonna be really enjoyable sex. You're checking off the box. It's gonna be obligatory. But if you're relaxed and spacious, you might get aroused and you might not. I say to women, don't feel obligated that you have to get aroused because you set up an, an initiation or there's a date on the calendar, right? If you're relaxed, um, excellent. Your opportunity, may increase because there's relaxation. So this whole uh, point of this topic is a relaxation ritual. What is your relaxation ritual, right? If I know there's an opportunity to connect with my husband, for instance, I know that reading a book or taking a bath or doing a little 10 minute meditation or a 10 minute dancing or having a cup of tea, something that really sets me into motion um, of relaxing. And that's really important because if we, we relax, then again, arousal has the potential to emerge. Okay. I'm going to pause and ask my teammates um, to come online here and help me out with some of the questions happening on the screen. Okay, next is how do we decline? How do we say no if it's, not an, if it's not a yes, right? I'm a big fan of only say yes if it's true yes. If, if your yes is maybe, then you might wanna go along with the, with the maybe and see if it happens, right? That's the gym metaphor. Ah, you know, don't really feel like going to the gym, but I'm gonna go to the gym because I, I usually warm up and wake up when, um, I'm ha when I'm at the gym and so I'm glad I'm there. But if you're like, this is not a gym day, I have absolutely no ability to wake up and, and go to the gym, it's a no. And so your no is important, right? Everyone's no is important because we don't wanna reject our partner. We wanna decline with connection. I define rejection as, an, as the absence of connection. Rejection is not failure. We do not fail here. That's not what this is about. Rejection is about a disconnection. I feel disconnected. So if we can decline and say no or rain check with connection, then the person receiving this doesn't feel so hurt. So this decline is, you know what? Thank you for the invitation. My body is just tired today. I'm not in the right space. I'm feeling stressed and um, it's, it's just not gonna work for me today, but can we try tomorrow? Or can we try on the weekend? Or can we cuddle instead? I think I have capacity for cuddling. Or can we have just a conversation in front of the fire? Or can we um, you know, do something else that has some sort of connection that might not be sexual? Because what we're trying to do is keep the connection alive, even if our sexuality doesn't feel as open and capable in that moment. So that's an important factor. We're gonna go through all these parts in a moment just so that if you're taking notes, you know what you're doing here. Again, personal responsibility for your arousal and desire. 
what can you do to create passion? Passion is energy. And this energy can be really contagious. Just like anxiety can be contagious, right? Have you read the news? And it's anxiety inducing. And then you feel anxious. Um, that, that it's, it's like a hot potato. But passion can also be contagious and be like a hot potato. So what can you do for yourself that creates passion? It's really a question you come back to yourself, you ask yourself, what's the ownership you can take for things that give you passion, right? Do you like to dance? Do you like to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Do you like to ride horses? Do you like to read a book? Do you like to journal? Do you like to cook? What do you like to do that gives you passion? I have, a, I have a friend who likes to do adult um, coloring books. Uh, not only is she passionate about it, but it relaxes her, so awesome, perfect. She's killing two birds with one stone, right? Right there, she's doing her relaxation ritual and she's accessing her passion. And what happens in her system is she gets all um, um, happy, she feels a good energy, she feels the fire inside of her, and then she can take that fire, turn towards her partner, and go, I have this passion, um, and maybe it's not sexual passion, and it isn't always sexual passion, right? It's just life energy. Life energy can be translated into sexual passion. And so once we start to touch, or kiss, or even just lay together in bed, if we're trying to generate that passion from our activity into the bedroom, it can translate, right? If we lay there like a dead fish and go, I kind of feel like a dead fish, that's not passionate, right? But if we're like, I just feel so good. I did my adult coloring or I did my bath or I had my cup of tea or uh, I danced or whatever it is that gives you passion, um, then you feel that energy brought into the bedroom. Okay. Another piece to talk about here is presence. So, being really present, being really mindful um, is an important component of pleasure. So when we talk about mapping our arousal and desire, we wanna optimize our pleasure. Pleasure is our birthright and pleasure is possible from the head to the toes, right? We can have, lot, we can have an orgasm in our ear if we redirect our energy into our ear or with some spinal cord, um, so, so, I, so some people who have disabilities with their spinal cord and don't have sensation from the waist down, sometimes they can redirect that pleasure and sensation into other parts of the body that do have sensation, like the ear or the neck. So whether you have um, a disability or not, the whole point of that is that we can really access our nerve endings and our body in different ways to access our pleasure. Pleasure is possible in the body. So to really access our pleasure, what we wanna do is be present. If we're laying there and we're distracted by our to-do list, or we're distracted by the porn we're watching, or we're distracted by, um, you know, maybe wor worried about something else in the room or something else in our life, or we're worried about our performance. How's my erection? How's my lubrication? if we're worried about just getting to the orgasm, right? We're not being present in our body at the moment things are happening, right? Being present is being mindful. Oh, I can feel my arousal, it's like a level three. I can notice that through the heat in my body and my genitals starting to come online. Oh, you know what, now my arousal's at a five, I'm really getting excited. I can feel that through more heat in my body and my breath is getting a little more shallow and, and accessible and, 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 and short, short breath, right? and my heart's going a little faster. So what you're doing here is you're tracking your body and being present with it. And that's important because then you can track your pleasure as well. You might be tracking pain, right? Some people feel pain. And I wanna to come to this, this is a good segue into pain because it's a great opportunity to track, oh, you know what, actually I feel numb. I notice as I'm having sex I feel numb from my belly up, or I feel numb in my genitals, um, or I feel numb, you know, until I'm about to have an orgasm, right? Numb or pain are indicators of something else may be happening in your body. Your body might be having a memory from a violation back from childhood, or a violation in adulthood, or this partner is not so safe, or I'm distracted and I'm really scared, right? The pain or the numb 
is an indicator of maybe I need support around this. Not I'm broken, not that anything's wrong with you, just I need support around this. So what you wanna be able to do with this is reach out for your support system, right? Find a certified sex therapist in your area. I get a lot of inquiries, I'm in Colorado, Please go to the ASEC website if you're not in Colorado. I can't work outside my state lines, but I appreciate the inquiries. ASEC, A-A-S-E-C-T dot org is a list of certified sex therapists nationally, and there are great therapists in this country to help you in your state if you do need that support. Um, there's also a lot of good trauma-informed therapists, trauma-informed or trauma-specialized, honestly, if there's deeper trauma, right? If there's, if there's violations like incest or childhood, um, you know, sexual violations that you're trying to heal, right? There's, that can be a pretty common thing, you're not alone, and lots of possibilities for healing, right? Good book is victims no longer. So while I'm sitting here advocating for pleasure and you're like, ah, I can't access my pleasure because I'm get, my pain or my numb are getting in the way, there's resources and there's support. And as you do your healing and get back into pleasure, right? As we feel the possibility of pleasure, you might consider having a mindfulness practice, a 10 minute practice where you feel your body. There are a lot of good apps out by the way now. There's a lot, an app called Lover and an app called Fairly, F-E-R-L-Y, that do just this, right? Like these meditations um, and the sexual health and knowledge to bring you into your body so that you can feel the pleasure that is possible in your body. So a few more things just to consider. Um, one of the questions I like to ask my female clients or somebody navigating female sexuality is, what is the best sex you've had and why? What you're doing here is you are mining the field um, of your experience for your data points that worked well for you. Maybe the best sex of your life was um, on a rug in front of the fireplace uh, at an Airbnb in another state. So then you gotta ask yourself, okay, well, maybe I like big furry rugs because they're really cozy, or I like the fireplace because it's a romantic ambiance, or I like being outside my house because no one's there and I have a lot of privacy, right? Various data points. Then you can say um, another sexual time that I really loved was um, uh, in the shower right? Um, maybe it was because there was water and you really like water. Maybe because you were standing and you like that position of standing. Um, maybe because uh, it's just a unique place and it's something different and you like the novelty of it. So what you're looking for in these patterns of asking yourself the best sex of your life is what are the things that work for me because they will give me hints to my erotic cornerstone. What are the things that really do it for me and turn me on? Right? What are the things that help me um, really get into that space? Not that you need to recreate this every time, right? Let's say you love the Airbnbs, but like that's expensive. You can't go to an Airbnb every time you wanna have sex. So <laughs> what do you do to recreate that, right? If you like the privacy, then you have to be creative about privacy. If you like the fact that it's not in this, it's not in your same space, like let's say you always have sex in your bedroom on your bed and you're like, ah, I'm bored by this, then maybe you get creative and say, you know, what? I'm gonna have sex in other rooms of the house. I'm going to have sex in the laundry room and in the bathroom and um, in the car, <laughs> or in the garage, wherever you can find a space that might be a little creative and different for you. So the idea here is to utilize those data points to insert them in when you can. Sometimes we just have maintenance sex. And by the way, that's fine. Maintenance sex is good for the relationship too. It's good for your sexual health and it's good for your relationship health. Why? Because you're just practicing the act of being in your pleasure. And it might not be pom-pom, amazing, passionate sex every time. It might just be maintenance. Yeah, we're here, we're connected. There's pleasure, great. That's okay. That's most of our sex to be honest, right? It, that, I, I call that um, you know, good maintenance sex. Some of the people in my field call it the good enough sex model. Um, but that's fine. That's our status quo. Not every single time could be amazing. If it were, then that would be the new routine and that would be the new bar and then that would get out of the ordinary and be, that would end up being boring. So we wanna have, again, a spectrum of different kinds of sex that we have. So we are out of time and I have had uh, interesting questions and comments. Thank you team for blocking the people that needed to be blocked. 
and I will say this, if you watch this after the fact and you have appropriate questions around sexual health and education for us, we have a great knowledgeable team. We are happy to answer those questions um, and we'll be back with you. Uh, well, we have Savvy Sex all the time, so check out our channel here. Those are our 60 to 90 second clips on sexual health and education. And by the way, this will stay live for 24 hours and then we repopulate it here and on our YouTube channel so that if you do want to watch it again, it's accessible to you. And if you have questions, you can always ask on our direct message um, thread here any questions you have for our team and we will get back to you. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next month. Bye-bye.